Turn them on. No worries. All right. Sounds good. Let's do this. All right. Yo, Short Box Nation. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. And if it's your first time tuning in, welcome to the Short Box Podcast, the comic book talk show that brings you the best conversations and interviews about comic books and pop culture inspired by comics. This is episode 418. My name is Botter, if we haven't met before. And for the OG... It's so weird. Yo, just in case there's like new listeners, you know? So I haven't met them yet. Yo, welcome to the show. I'm Botter, your host. I'm sure there's a few people that are... I like, haven't followed your kids home from school yet. <laughs> it's so weird, dude. I'm on a couple of lists, um, but... <laughs> God. All right, we're starting off terrible, all right? Considering the guests we got, we're starting off terrible. Um, for my OG listeners, you might recognize the uh, the voice to my left, uh, camera right. And it's one that I, I'm, I'm excited to have back on the show. He's joining me for the ride. It's my man, Cesar Cordero. Look, buddy, it's not about me this episode. I'm excited about who we're talking about. Who are we talking about today? Well, really quick, I want to say it's never about you. Oh, so just, you know. Okay. Setting the uh, setting the bar there. Just a oh, reminder. Oh, there's the. But you know what? I'm going to I'm going to keep this intro short because most of you uh, were just treated to a minute and a half uh, ad for CollectiveCon, which is taking place in March. So I'm going to keep this very short and brief because I'm excited uh, to say Cesar's point about our guest today. Shortbox Nation. Without further ado, let's welcome. Actually, you know, let's go ahead and welcome our guest of honor today. Mm. He's a highly acclaimed writer of titles such as Conan the Barbarian, Black Panther, Deathstroke, Justice League. And most recently, he's been at the helm writing for comics' most iconic and original bad girl, Vampirella. Mm. If you haven't put the pieces together, or if, if you haven't uh, if you press play on this episode and you didn't notice the, uh, the title of this episode, I'm talking about the distinguished Christopher Priest. He's on the show today to talk about a mind-bending new Vampirella story that will celebrate the beginning of Vampy's sixth decade in comics, which launches with the landmark issue, Issue 666. Give him that riff, see? That's all I got. Darkness imprisoning me of the Nazi. Absolute horror. Vampirella Issue 666 is in shops this Valentine's Day, which I think is very cute, right? It's very, very, very heartwarming. Outstanding. So the same day that this episode drops, you can go into your local comic shop right now and pick up Issue 666, a brand, a start of a brand new story arc as Dynamite Entertainment leads Vampirella onto the road 700. Shortbox Nation, let's give it up for the man, the myth, the legend himself, Christopher Priest. 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 Okay. It's, it's, uh, they love you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's largely myth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's... that's uh, and, uh, and, 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 Botter, you're only on a couple of lists. You know, you... you nice. Probably, you know. I'm on the list that matter, you know. You're gonna, uh, gonna you are gonna fit in just fine. Dunking <laughs> on either of us with oh, yeah. salt is is wonderful and also encouraged on this show. So yeah, they're gonna love you, Chris. No, that, how, was self -de that was self deprecating humor. That's well, yeah, I'm sorry. That's what ahead, we do please. best here, the man. best kind. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. built a we built a whole podcast uh, uh, glory off that. You know, we suck. <laughs> Yay! We will we will capitalize <laughs> and, and on our and neurosis. And you left out Superman. I mean, I know I, you know we want to talk about Vampirella, but mm. uh, you know. Go run out and buy Superman Lost. That's 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 on sale now. That's I'm just trendy. wrapping up that series. I'm very proud of it. We worked really hard on it, and uh, you know, it's it's like I've waited 45 years to hmm. to, to finally, you know, finally, you know, Dad gave me the keys to the car. Oh like, okay, wow! All right, here, here you go, son. Take the caddy around the block here, and, and uh, we trust you with our with our marquee character. Now, mind you, Marvel trusted me with Spider Man, their marquee character. 40 years ago. Hmm. So thanks, DC, for catching up. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, here, here we are. Here we are. You know, uh, Reese, I was going to save this question for when we were getting, like, sentimental. We were getting deep into the interview. But with you bringing up uh, Superman, I know how long you've been waiting to, you know, you, to use your, your uh, analogy, get the keys to the car. How do you feel about your, your career right now and, like, where you're at, knowing that, you know, you've, you're, you're wrapping up a Superman series, you know, like, there's a lot of attention and praise about, you know, all of your, your, your iconic prior work, and now you're getting to lead, like, such an iconic character like Vampirella into, you know, a, a new milestone. Like, how are you feeling about your career? Well, uh, I, I guess I feel pretty good about it. It's this weird bifurcation where, you know, I'll go to these shows and, and I'll find so much love and, and friendship. And like I was at uh, C2E2 a couple of years ago and uh, uh, the line to see me was like wrapping around hmm. 
the corner and 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 extending down the, you know you know you know down the hall and it's you know the big floor down across the floor so you know so they sent like the blue shirts out with the little bank stanchions you know like the the little little yep. excuse me pardon me you know they're setting these things up and I can't believe they're doing that. So I get up from around the table and I and I look around the corner. I see all these people lined up back there, you know. And I go, "Are you? Do you? Are you sure you're in the right line? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not Scott Snyder. I'm really not. You know. Uh, so it, it's this weird second act, you know. Uh, you know, in, in, in career wise. Uh, uh, on the flip side, though, you know, when I'm dealing with the publishers. It's just kind of like, eh, it's the old guy, you know. So <laughs> it's 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 a weird, uh, you know, it's a, it's it's a weird dichotomy, you know. So I I don't really know what to think, um, but uh, you know, certainly I'm grateful, uh, for the second act because, uh, you know, as you may or may not know, I stepped away, mm -hmm. uh, or, or actually I was catapulted away from comics for almost a decade. <laughs> Um, where uh, I think I was writing Captain America and the Falcon for Marvel, and uh, and uh, then they 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 ended the Marvel Knights Captain America book, so they was gonna just have one Captain America book, and I thought that Joe Bennett and I were going to move on and do the hmm. and be the one solo uh, Cap book, because huh. uh, I felt like we had done a good job with Captain America and the Falcon. I thought we had certainly earned our shot. Uh, and uh, and we didn't get it. They gave it to Ed Brubaker. No no offense to Ed, he's a great uh, a great writer. They did a terrific job with that book. Um, but I felt like that, that Joe and I had earned that earned that shot. And uh, and then when it didn't happen, uh, you know the the suggestion that it came from Marvel, like, well, hey, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take uh, we're gonna take Captain America out of the book and relaunch it as the Falcon. And uh, and I felt like I was being demoted and I felt mm -hmm. like, you know, the message it was sending me was that, well, I'm not good enough for prime time, that hmm. I, I could no longer be trusted with the, the marquee characters. So dad's taking the keys back, or whatever the metaphor is. Uh, and uh, so I just politely said, thank you, but no, thank you. And, uh, and I went off and I did other things. And yes, there are other things to do outside of comics. And uh, for about a decade, you know, Every 18 months, I'd get a, an offer from Marvel or DC, but it was always to write like, you know, you know, African Panda Boy, you know, or, uh, you know, something like it My was favorite. always it, it was inevitably, you know, Black Goliath or yeah, Black sure. something or, you know, medium brown tempo, whatever, you know, uh, and, and I would always just kind of go, well, no, you know, and then I would go, well, well what about Green Lantern? I like Green Lantern. He's green. I could do that, right? You know, and then they go, well, maybe not. And so, you know, it, it really wasn't until 2017 when DC offered me Deathstroke. Mm -hmm. And my first question right out the box was, is he black? You know, because they had been like running a few of their characters through the car wash, you know, and through the paint shop, you know. So I was like, well, is this, is he, is he, is he black? And they went, no, he's still, you know, Slade Wilson. And I went, uh huh. I don't know. Okay, I'm listening, you know, and we kind of, you know, got into that. And uh, and all of a sudden I started reading like in the trade press, you know, Priest is back. And I'm like, well, I never really went anywhere. You know, the business went away from me where they just started like going, well, you know, he's the guy who writes the black characters. Mm. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, to be uh, in the driver's seat with the whitest character of them all, you know, <laughs> and, the, and the one who started it all. With the guy in the red cape, you know, uh, uh, I felt like, well, you know, here finally we're back to being—I don't want to say color blind, but that, but that, but having color have less influence about uh, where you slide. You know, I, I just don't believe in this idea of, you know, so if you have a, you know, a Japanese lesbian samurai, you have to find a Japanese lesbian samurai to write her. Sure, you know, um, uh, that 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 I should be limited by you know uh you know by the uh you know the characteristics that that uh, by my individual characteristics i should be able to uh as long as i'm the master of this particular universe i feel like i should be qualified to write wonder woman hmm. or batman or or spider man or or, or or whatever or spider ham the pig guy That's you right. know whatever you got lying around you know i really feel like a writer writes and uh i think we're finally getting back to that where you know, women are qualified to write male characters and, 
you know, LGBTQ uh, writers are qualified to write straight characters and vice versa. We really shouldn't be in this business of just limiting people's horizons based on, you know, you know, dumb criteria. Division. Yeah. 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 I I gotta say that I, I know writing, speaking on that same sort of, I guess, current, a lot of characters come with baggage, right? What was it like writing for Soups? I mean, that character has a lot of history and sometimes baggage and different people have either <laughs> projected that onto the character. Um, what was it like for you, you know, getting the keys to the, 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 the big boy in blue, you know, the, the hermetic symbol, the, the sun god, the, the messianic figure? Like, what's it, what's it like? Well, it was terrifying on two different levels. Sure. One's because of all the history, but I didn't. I, my story is out of continuity, so I don't have to worry about whatever they're doing. Uh, so thank God for that. Uh, but um, uh, I also uh, have Mike Carlin's phone number. Uh, Mike Carlin. Oh yeah. Uh, used to be the editor editor in chief of DC, but before that, he was, you know, maybe one of the best Superman Superman editors ever. Yep. Uh, and I helped get him his first job in comics so larry hama and i recommended him for his first job in comics back when he was working at the rug, rug factory look at you man <laughs> you know? stories for days man i could just listen to you talk man this is great <laughs> so you know uh mike carlin is kind of the unsung hero of superman lost uh he was the kind of the guy behind the scenes who i would uh spend literally hours on the phone with uh hmm. and then of course mark wade i mean that's kind of the a, a rule in comics when you get stuck call mark wade because uh, Mark knows everything, and uh, and I, I'd be, you know, pardon the pun, I would be lost, you know, without those guys. So having that guidance. Um, but the other side of the, the the coin of me being frightened is that uh, that that I'm me, and what that means is I tend to be a little bit uh, subversive, uh, which is why people, I think, uh, some editors kind of shy away from me because a lot of, you know mainstream comics uh are constructed in a way that i think is a little on the and and again i don't want to get myself in trouble but it's youtube so yeah, yeah you, you're fine uh, i feel like a lot of mainstream comics are constructed in kind of a condescending and juvenile way where it's like plot device a plot device b and here's our uh a story and our b story and here's our villain of the month and it's very formulaic you know, and like, so these guys are going to rob the bank and they all dress alike. They all have like matching outfits. Who, who stops by the tailor before they, before they rob a bank, you know, and, and so on and so forth, you know, so, you know, and then when you give the same job to priest, like with the justice league, you know, the first thing I did was I took their satellite and I crashed it in Somalia and I had the, 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 the team dissolve into bickering over whether they should just pack up their wrecked satellite and leave or whether they should stay and protect uh, these these uh, refugees who had gathered around the satellite wreckage, you know, because they knew the Justice League was was there and that the warlords would not kill them, mm. you know. And the Justice League is like, we can't get involved in this, in this Somalia Somalian civil war. We really can't get involved in this. We have a greater responsibility. We're just waiting for the Green Lanterns to return from space so we can pack up all of our wreck our wrecked satellite and get the hell out of here. You know, and Wonder Woman is like, but the minute we leave, the warlords are going to come in and wipe these people out. You know, so, it, you know, it became this big sort of tension between like half the group wanted to stay and half the group wanted to leave and what was the right thing to do and that kind of stuff. And that's what I look for. I try to take the characters, whatever the characters are, including Vampirella, and we'll get her, get to her. We'll get to sure. her. Calm down. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, but I try to take the characters and I just try to go, number one, how do I put this character in a headlock? Mm hmm. And number two, what is it that we haven't seen before, you know, and what kind of ethical dilemma or ethical crises can I introduce and put, put these characters into? Sure. So that's kind of, you know, when I got my hands on Superman, that was kind of, you know, uh, you know, my thing there. And, you know, we got to do some things in that book that had never been done before. Like Lois Lane and Superman, they have a, a knockdown drag out fight. I've never seen Lois and Superman have a fight before. And I thought that was ridiculous. You know, all married people or all people married or not, anyone in any relationship, sooner or later, they're going to have some sort of disagreement, you know? And I went, well, that's, that's just dumb. So, you know, and, and, and so, you know, you know, this is, you know, there's an issue here where, where, you know, Lois has been doing some, 
thing behind Superman's back. Superman finds out about it. And he's like, you know, we're not going to be those people. Don't you lie to me. And we're having the, the usual, you know, husband and wife fight, you know, and it's like, you know, instead of them, you know, instead of the thing punching the Hulk, it's Lois and Superman going at it for four pages. And it's something we've never seen before. Hmm. And there's ethical dilemmas that we haven't seen before in this book. And, uh, you know, and that makes me nervous because, you know, it's so out of the, the out of step with the mainstream of how the of comic of the comic book narrative in mainstream comics. And, uh, and, and, and I know that, uh, it's going to rankle some people to see, you know, these kind of questions or just have these kind of issues brought to such an iconic character, an iconic character. And yet they let me get away with it. So, you know, kudos to DC. Priest, I feel like we, we've hit the ground running for this uh, interview, and, and I love that. But I want to take a, a quick zoom out and and ask, you're currently still living in, in Colorado, right? In Denver, Colorado? I am in an, indis- an undisclosed location. Undisclosed location. Okay. Uh, well, last- Watchtower, <laughs> yeah. outer space. I guess last I heard what was, was Denver, Colorado, and um, I, it, it kind of struck- Colorado Springs, actually. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I asked that because last year I got to- Cross something off my comic book bucket list. I, I got a, I was in Denver and I got a chance for a conference and I had the chance to go to what many would deem a uh, comic book holy place. And that was Mile High Comic Books. Yes. And I was curious from a, you know, established comic book writer's perspective, what is the, the, the comic scene like in Denver through your eyes? Like if I was to make another trip out there, is there, is there other shops or, or things I could do in that kind of nerdy comic book realm? How, how is, I guess, long story short, how is uh, Colorado, uh, yeah, how's the comic book scene in Colorado? I couldn't tell you. I really wouldn't know. Um, I try to sort of make it my business to kind of fly under the radar wherever I happen to live. Uh, so I would visit comic shops from time to time, but I would just be any other, you know, uh, shopper in there, you know, uh, you know, minding my business. I don't like go to the, to the counter and go, hi, I'm Christopher Priest. You know, I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't do stuff like that. Uh, although there's been times when I've gone to comic shops and I've gone to the counter with like a half dozen copies of the same comic book. Hmm. And then I hand them my credit card that says Christopher Priest. And, you know, whoever's at the counter, they don't seem to make the connection. They don't seem to make... And no one ever asked me, well, why do you want six copies of the same, <laughs> the same you know? Uh, uh, but, but, but by and large, I really have... Uh, like, I, I would not do con- uh, conventions in Colorado Springs. Uh, I, I only recently started doing uh, appearances in, in Denver, uh, mainly because, you know... When I'm going to Walmart, I don't want people to recognize me and go, "Hey, you're Christopher Priest. Let's talk to about, about Spider-Man." I, no, you feel uh, like I'm just trying it, to get some cereal, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and it's happened to me. It's happened to huh. me where, where somebody recognized me, uh, and uh, she, this is a woman. She saw me at a traffic light, and I was going to Home Depot, and I was going to Lowe's, Lowe's Home Improvement. I was going to buy, you know, I don't know, a toilet seat, whatever it was. You know, and, uh, and and she saw me in a traffic light and she followed me into the parking lot, into the store. And she comes up to me breathless, you know, while I'm, you know, in the, the, the toilet seat aisle or wherever I am, you know, it's just like, ah, you're going to a priest. I'm like, oh, dear God, you know, so, yeah. So, unfortunately, I, I, I'm, I wasn't really plugged in, you know, not really plugged into the, the, the local uh, scene. I, I, and I, I'm a disappointment to everyone. I'm sorry. Well, priest, it's actually glad you mentioned that. We have this lady right back here. Uh- <laughs> Come on out, uh, Eunice. Why don't you come on out? <laughs> yeah, what exactly. toilet sheet did you go for? <laughs> I don't know why she's. I want the ones that. I want the ones that that slowly, slowly you descend. Know, this, you A know, man of slowly, culture, yeah. I see. Well, well, to see the thing about it is, this is great. You know, this is why people tune into the show. <laughs> you know, I I just moved the into a new place question. and they had brand new toilet seats, and I appreciate. Thank you for the brand new toilet seats, but they they were they were you know obviously, and I, I'm going to be sexist here, gentlemen. Obviously, some woman bought them. Actually, I know for a fact a woman bought them because I, 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 I know the woman who put them in. So, so, so very sweet person. I understand that. But, you know, I, I, I have to explain to her, we're men. Okay? We pee standing up. At least well, I do. All right. Speak for yourself, I guess. But, I, you know, I pee standing up. 
So, you know, and, and men being, you know, not only do we pee standing up, but we are intrinsically lazy. This is the you know? best interview ever. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is setting a new bar. But, you know, so, so being able to just like do your business in the, like it's two o'clock in the morning, you know, and I'm half awake as it is. And you do whatever it is you get went in there to do and then just swat the thing and walk away and it doesn't slam and it'll close melodically on its own. I don't, butter, that's what I want. Butter, I, want to to see, I want to see you do a segue after that oh. statement. Let's see if you <laughs> can do it. I think I got it. Let's see if you can do it. Can you land I think this? I got can it. you land this? I, I think I got Speaking it. Speaking of Deadpool. Uh... Yeah, well, actually... <laughs> Speaking, you mentioned uh, comic conventions, and my understanding is that you were given the opportunity to write Vampirella back in 2018. You, you told the yes. story on, on another interview um, that CEO and publisher of Dynamite Entertainment, Nick Barucci, Barucci, I think that's how you said Barucci. Barucci, personally drove five hours to Mohegan yes. Sun in uh, Connecticut, I believe, to, in your yes. words, in your words, to ambush you. About yes. taking on Vampirella, and you mentioned being hesitant at first. I don't want to uh, tell the story, and then you tell your story. Um, so I, that, you know, I'll, I'll talk it. to you. That's it. You know, Nick had been calling, he had been writing, oh. I've been getting emails, and and I, and I, I I'm just uh, the things that you gentlemen need to know about me is that I have no ambition whatsoever, <laughs> and uh, except for drifted. toilet seats. Yeah. Yes. Well, well Killer that's not really ambition. Seat. That's just, you know, me being Necessity. lazy. Look at him. Humble. Yeah. Humble. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, and I've kind of drifted through much mm. of my career where people come to me and say, hey, do you want to write I, Banana Man? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. You know, so uh, <laughs> I've been really blessed to not have to spend a whole lot of time mm. hunting for work. The work usually kind of hunts me. So here... I was being hunted for, for Vampirella and uh, you know, it, it, it was kind of like this, this, this echo or this noise in the back of my head because I couldn't imagine what Vampir who, hmm. you know, you know, uh, I mean, I knew who the character was, but really me Vampirella. So, you know, I, I don't know. It, it just kept slipping off of my radar. Uh, and it was just, you know, th there was, I think there was an episode of Seinfeld where, uh, uh, Seinfeld, uh, he, he goes to uh, confession at a Catholic uh, church, <laughs> and he's complaining about his dentist yep. who has converted to Judaism and yep. he's making all these Jewish jokes. And, and this offends and you a... as a Jewish person, Jerry? No, it offends me as a comedian. <laughs> comedian. <laughs> you, know, you know, and so we finish that bit with the priest, and he opens the door, and there's George Costanza, you know, waiting for him outside the door. And he's like, how did you know I was here? You know, uh, and that's how I felt about Barucci. We're like, I turned, I literally turned around, and here's Nick Barucci. And hmm. I'm like, oh, my God, you know, and he's still talking about Vampirella. Um so I think that was, uh, you know, uh, the moment where I, I said, okay, let me give this some serious thought. Hmm. And uh, I think with every character, uh, like with Deathstroke, for example, um, uh, I knew, uh, I know, I know Marv Wolfman. Uh, I, I was his intern when I was, you know, 17 years old. Wow. Uh, Xeroxing pages from Tomb of Dracula, Gene Colan. Outstanding. Uh, pencil art. Over and over and over again, you know? Um, so uh, when they offered me Deathstroke, my first thought was Marv, you know? Um, I, not Number one, I don't want to offend Marv of anything that I do, but, but two, I'm going, well, you know, can I dig around inside that character's head and, and pull something out that interests me or pursue something that interests me that hasn't been pursued quite, you know, like based on what I've read of Deathstroke, uh, uh, and what I know about that character, what is left undone or what is left untouched. Hmm. So uh, I think once Nick made that effort to come up to the hmm. uh, casino, you know, I said, okay, I need to sort of apply the same brain power to Vampirella, whom I've only written once or twice before as kind of one-offs, but there really wasn't much there. Vampirella has always been sort of this empty character where, 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 where writers are working the suit. Hmm. Or in a sling bikini and they're working the suit and it's like, you know, blood and fangs and, and, and TNA and let's go, you know, and, and, and there's your formula, you know, and I went, I, that, that doesn't interest me. You know, what do I know about this woman? And, and, and it turns out that, that, you know, it was pretty much a, a blank slate. Like there, any number of writers who have written uh, Vampirella 
and they've been given kind of a free hand to create their own vision of the character. Uh, and uh, Nick gave me, you know, pretty much carte blanche to kind of create the priest verse. Hmm. So although there are other Vampirella books written by other writers, the books that I write that has Vampirella in them, they all have their own internal continuity and uh, their own unique thing. They all exist within our corner of the dynamite uh, uh, publishing scheme. Um, so that's kind of how that how that happened. And, and once I was able to kind of go to take it seriously, not that I mean, obviously the offer was serious, uh, but once I was able to take the character seriously, uh, and would I be you know given free range to uh, uh, to fully explore? You know, what if there really was this this person who was marooned here on our planet uh, and it is kind of new to our culture? Uh, and uh, uh, it's it's a it's a it's a timeless story of someone who just wants to go home, hmm. you know. And 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 what would that person be like? And what were the implications of that? And so forth. And that's when the wheels started spinning. And uh, and that's when we started our, our work together. So I went to without you, without getting too serious. But we're in it now. Um, <laughs> We're in it now, priest. Let's do it. So I went to okay. a private Christian college, and I've done my fair share of study regarding uh, hermeneutics and homiletics, and I hold a reverence for Scripture. And I'm okay. not saying that you know, you're know you trying to preach with any of your stuff, but that's not stopping me from shouting down your work with amens and preaches, okay? <laughs> I'll just say that. So, And while reading of all things, Vampirella. So I, I was pleasant going to hell for reading Vampirella. Uh, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised. So what is your favorite thing about that character? Like, what's the most important thing to remember when you write for someone like Vampirella? She's such an iconic and beloved character. All right, let's uh, put a pin in that. Let's 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 dabble back to the Christianity thing. Sure, so sure. For 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 most people who are, are even remotely familiar with me, you will know that I am. In a, an ordained former pastor. I pastored two churches in Colorado, um, and uh, yada yada yada. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, and uh, I had an online ministry and blah 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 blah. You know, so every now and then I get to sort of hang out, <coughs> hang out my minister shingle, like in Superman Lost. Uh, the uh, so that, that's ten issues. So issue number nine, uh, Lex Luthor is like taunting Lois Lane. You know, saying, "Well, you know, Miss Lane, you know." Because they're 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 worried about Superman. Is I won't get into what the reasons are, but she's but but Luther gives her, gives Lois a speech about faith, you know, and he's like, you know, well, I never really thought much about faith, but you know, it's a good story, you know. It's like there's these two guys and they're walking down the road and they're talking about uh, this mysterious godlike creature, and then a third guy joins them, you know, and and you know and and, and walks along with them, but but he doesn't allow them to see his face. The Emmaus walk. Right. You know, and that's the title of the story is Emmaus, you know, um, and Luther is like, you know, and, and he's going on and on about this godlike creature. And he's making a reference to Superman, obviously. Sure. You know, um, so uh, later in the story, Lois, you know, spoiler alert, she beats Luther at his own game because she's Lois Lane after all. Of course. You know, she beats and and, and then she like, you know, uh, back claps him on his on his story. He goes, you know, Luther, the, you know. You know those two guys walking on the road? You know the reason why uh, you know the godlike creature didn't allow them to see his face is because they didn't believe. And she looks Luther dead in the eye and he goes, "I believe, Luther." You know, and and that's why I I beat you at whatever this game is, whatever that kind of thing. You know, so every now and then when when you know I don't write the story to serve my particular you know they wouldn't be faith based. Yeah, Sorry? They, they wouldn't be good if that was what you were doing. My 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 praise to you is essentially when I read your stuff, I'm not necessarily looking for it. And every now and then there'll be something subtle. You kind of have to know the reference, <laughs> but it'll right. be something to the effect of, well, you know, that's not what this is. You know, there are messages of morality and love and mercy in the most unexpected places, and they're incredibly welcome. And at the same time, I have never felt more sympathy for a character like Deathstroke, <laughs> who is a statutory rapist and a murderer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor Deathstroke. You know, uh, but on the other hand, <laughs> but, uh, 
But Love on the it. other hand, you know, uh, my favorite issue of Deathstroke is issue number 20. Hmm. In issue number 20 of Deathstroke, he is trying to recruit Power Girl, the black Power Girl, Tanya, hmm. what's her name? You know, he's trying to rec- recruit her because he's putting together his own uh, Teen Titans. I can do it better. Yeah. You know, so I'll put together my own group of heroes by blackmailing them and <laughs> twisting their arms and murder. <laughs> That's how he puts together his team of heroes. But anyway, so he's trying to blackmail her. Now, Tanya, as I wrote her, I wrote her as a born-again Christian. Interesting. So Destro goes to her house, knocks on her door, and he starts quoting scripture to her. To, to, to convince her to join his team, you know, and she's like, stop that, stop that, <laughs> you know, and he's like, you know, well, well, you know, you, you know he said like, you know, that's what's look up. I'm going to stop you right here. Okay. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Hmm. And, and Tanya's like, what are you talking about? It's like, okay, you know, once, once I have, you know, uh, confessed and once I have asked for your forgiveness, you have to forgive me. Those are the rules, you know. And she goes, the rules? Because, yeah, that's what makes you born-again people so much fun. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you can be so easily manipulated. They're like Klingons. You like s- a Klingon, the way to manipulate a Klingon is through their sense of, 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 of honor. honor. You know, so issue number 20, the entire issue is basically written in King James Scripture. Huh. You know, and, and here we have uh, uh, Deathstroke's son, Jericho. Mm. Uh, pr- issues previous, he had attempted to murder uh, his ex-lover to, to silence his ex-lover who was going to reveal that, uh, that they had had some sort of, you know, uh, homosexual encounter or whatever the story was, you know, and in this issue, you know, uh, he's on the plane with his dad and, 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 and this guy who was one of Deathstroke's ex henchmen, he calls up to the plane and Deathstroke's like, well, where you been? I've been trying to reach you. And he's like, Oh, er, er, well, hang on a second. And he, he, you know, he goes to, over to uh, the Jericho. It's for you. And he goes to the Jericho. So Jericho's on the phone, and he's trying not to let Slade know what's going on because Slade will just lose his mind, you know. And and the guy's on the phone, and uh, mind you, Jericho tried to kill him. He threw him off a building. The guy almost died. He tried to kill him. And the guy calls up, and he tells Jericho that I forgive you because the guy has become this born-again Christian. He has found Christ, and and he's like, you know, uh, that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, that, you know, you have, I forgive you. You have to forgive yourself. I forgot what the, what the poetry was, you know, and, and Jericho just loses it on the plane. And Slade is looking at him like something in your eye. What's going on here? Sure. You, know, you know, that kind of thing. Hey kid. But you know, <laughs> it's an incredibly emotional issue. That's just me laying it on with a trawl, you know, <laughs> and I just figured it was going to come boomeranging back from the executives with red marks all over. You can't say this. You can't say that. And and the fact that DC published it, so I, I was so happy about it that I called up, I, I, I emailed Rich Johnston, hmm. you know, like I, I couldn't believe that they approved it. And it came out, I'm holding the thing in my hand. Oh my God. So I emailed Rich Johnston and I, I, I wrote this really glowing sort of love letter to DC about, oh, I love DC. And here's a song <laughs> about DC. All day long, DC. We love you, DC. Dan Dio, right? Yeah. So I, you know, it, it was this glowing thing, right? And I sent it to Rich Johnson. Rich Johnson, of course, he immediately uploads it to Bleeding Cool, so it's right up there, you know. And now it's Saturday morning, and the phone rings, and it's Bob Harris. And I go, I've known Bob Harris for thirty years. I've never gotten a call from Bob Harris at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, and I'm like. What's blown up or on fire? What did I do? You know, and, and Bob and Dan, they're up in arms. Like, oh, how dare you talk to Rich Johnson without talking to us? And, you know, and I'm like, well, what's the big deal? You know, I said, the thing was completely positive and glowing, you know, <laughs> praise for your company, you know, and you're, and you're pissed at me about it because I didn't go through their apparatus their hmm. you know, but at any rate, I was really pleased that the, the you know, uh, let me segue one more. I'm sorry, I'm running my mouth, but, but let's get back to Nick Barucci, okay? So we're at the, the casino, and I said, okay, my big hang-up with, with writing Vampirella was not necessarily the costume, because I see more revealing stuff in music videos these days. Sure. Mm-hmm. My hang-up was that uh, at some point they had moved the character away from her science fiction origins and made it more occult based. And now she's hanging out with demons and she's talking to the devil and, you know, and all this other stuff. And I went, well, first of all, that's really not the character. You go all the way back to the Warren stuff. You go all the way back to the origin of this character. 
it was a it was a a, a science fiction spoof. It was Barbarella with fangs. Right. You know, she's um, from Draculon and all that stuff. She's from Draculon. Yeah. It was a spoof. You know. So I told Nick, I said, look, I'm just not comfortable uh, writing the devil. Um, I don't like you like it when they make the devil a cartoon character or a comic book character. And it's not that I'm, a, you know, uh, that I'm anti-devil. Don't get me wrong. If you like the devil, that's fine with me. Um, <clears throat> it's just that it's, it's, it, it's bad theology that it's not, you know, because, because, you know, comic book writers tend to write the devil like like he's Lex Luthor, and like you know, like the devil is the counterpart to God. So you have the All Father, and you have Dark Side, and like the devil is this, and God is that. You know, and I went, well, have you ever read a Bible? Have you ever looked? Have you ever cracked a cup? You know, have you ever, you know, uh, if you you know a- a- read any theology text, it's it just you know, the, the devil was once upon a time he was this angel, and the angel got so full of himself, and God smacked him around, and you know, but you know the in terms of the scale of their power, you know, the devil is not the equal of God, could never be the equal of God. The creation could never be the equal of the creator. You know, it's ridiculous. So I, I, I won't write that sort of Christian mythology that, because that, that all that does is perpetuate stupid stuff that, that Christians, you know, tell their kids at bedtime, you know, Ooh, the devil's going to get you, you know? Uh, so I said, look, you know, uh, and you know, you know, if I have to write about the devil or, 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 you know, uh, I want to be allowed to write about God. Um, because most publishers are just, they, they, any publisher will let you write anything you want about the devil. But as soon as you start writing about God, they get nervous because God means different things to different people and, and they don't want to offend anybody. So they get really nervous about, you know, about the God stuff. Uh, but right. I said, look, you know, if I could be allowed to write about God, then I'll, I, I'm a lot more, that, that, that gets me closer to being in on this thing. And Nick didn't hesitate. He was like, sure. You know, and you know, there have been issues of Vampirella, several of them, you know, uh, where, uh, I've laid it really on. I, there was one issue, I think issue eight, where she's talking to father Gutierrez and Gutierrez is, is lecturing Vampirella on, uh, you know, on, on forgiveness and, and so forth. And he's, he's, we're laying that on with the trial. And then there's a, hmm. Uh, she has this lesbian uh, love interest uh, named Victory, and uh, 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 Vampirella's mother sends Victory undercover at a Christian school to spy on them because she's up to some nefarious stuff with this Christian school. Okay, so Victory's undercover as a spy working in the office at this Christian school, but the longer she longer she's there, she ends up having a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ. Okay, so now Victory accepts you know, the idea accepts Christ as her savior, but now she's afraid to, to, to come out with it because then all her vampire friends are going to try to eat her or something, you know? <laughs> so, so she's like the secret, like many of us are, are this undercover Christian, you know? Uh, and, and these are kind of concepts that, that, you know, that, that, that fascinate me, not because I'm trying to push religion on people, mm. but because it just fascinates me. The idea of this pseudo vampiric character having this relationship with Christ that is now causing this enormous conflict in her life and, and forcing her to grow and make choices and become a better person. You know, uh, I think it's interesting for the character. It's an interesting narrative to follow. It's something we haven't seen before. Sure. A Christian vampire. Come on, fellas. Come on. Are <laughs> yeah. you with me? Yeah. It's, you know? uh, it's, uh, you know, it's drama 101, create conflict <laughs> and then you get drama. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I, I, I like the freedom that, that dynamite affords. Uh, and that to date, they really haven't smacked my hand much, hmm. you know. Well, now you got to uh, write a song about them. Yeah. <laughs> dynamite, <laughs> dynamite, your love is like dynamite. Jermaine Jackson already has a song called Dynamite. We could just play that. I mean, we could do it. You're right. <laughs> we could do it. An excuse to play Jermaine Jackson on this. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> Pretty sad. That's right. Fair use. Fair it, that's use. It. You brought up... Um, yeah, you brought up an issue of Vampirella, and I don't know if uh, our listeners uh, got what I said in the intro that with the launch of issue six six six, it's it's a return back to Vampirella's legacy numbering. It's not so much. I, I guess maybe I, what I want to emphasize is that you've been writing Vampirella since twenty nineteen. Uh, that includes 
uh, the 25 issues of the the main series. Uh, I think you've written two spinoff uh, limited runs, uh, Vampirella, Dracula, Unholy, Rage, and what was, what was the third one? You... Uh, Vampirella Year One. Year One, okay. So that's, what, that's when she's a kid and she sneaks a cow onto the subway. My hands down favorite scene <laughs> in Vampirella is kid Vampirella, age cool. 12, sneaking a cow onto a subway. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I would have ever guessed that sentence in my lifetime. <laughs> but now I've got to check it out. So I guess what, what because I because she, she's trying to feed the homeless people on the surface world. Hmm. Go ahead. Well, yeah. well, I guess what I want to ask is with Dynamite clearly, you know, really pushing this as you know a good jumping on point. You know, a return to the legacy numbering. You know, the road to seven hundred starts now. I'm I'm curious from your perspective. Does this new, I won't even call it a relaunch. Let's call it maybe like a, a reset or I don't even know what I want to call it, but. With this new campaign going on, does it do anything for you? Like, does it give you a second win, or is it just like business as, as normal? Like, I guess does the the numbering mean anything to you? I mean, clearly, it's it's you know, it, she's almost to seven hundred. You know, almost sixty years of publication. Like, what does that mean for you as the, from a writer perspective? Well, uh, a bunch of things. Well, first of all, it, it, it's it's flattering that they want to want me to stick around. Hmm. Um, I figured by now I would have gotten Das Boot, you know. Um, <laughs> I also appreciate they, that one of your characters' name is Jürgen, and the Das Boot <laughs> reference, I was like, yeah, Jürgen Prochnow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's nice to be wanted, and, hmm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, but in this atmosphere, this publishing atmosphere, like once upon a time, you know, when, when, you know before you guys were born, back when I was young, uh, People stayed on comic books until they literally passed away. You know, Dick Dillon drew drew Justice League, and I think I, I believe it was right up until the time that he that he left us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, and uh, people you know had very long runs. You know, uh, and were identified. You know, Irv Novik with uh, the Flash and Batman and so forth. You know, and nowadays people are just constantly either being they're either moving on for greener pastures or being pushed off because the sales are. Well, now we lost a couple of sales, so so let's let's retool mm -hmm. and do a new number one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just first of all, first and foremost, flattered to be asked to, to stick around. Uh, beyond that, uh, the numbering, you know, it gives us a chance to do a big promotional push, which is why the three of us are sitting here, yeah, uh, for the book and and to gain the attention. Um, what I wanted to do editorially or narratively for six 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 was I wanted to, uh, and I had planned to do this. I didn't know what number they were going to give it before they came up with this, you know, with this, with this numbering uh, idea. Uh, uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to go uh, all the way back to the beginning, back to where uh, artist Ergon Gunduz and I uh, arrived on the book. So mm -hmm. if you go all the way back to our volume five, issue one, uh, and, and, and our take on Vampirella, and, and now we get to do, the Jetsons theme song. Uh, uh, I I don't know. You may be too young to remember the the cartoon, the Jetsons, or the oh. themes. Do you know the theme song to the Jetsons? His it's boy like, Elroy, you know, like Jane, me, George his wife, Jetson, yeah, Jane, his yeah. wife, dun, dun, right dun, there, dun. boy Elroy, yep. daughter Judy. So you know, in sixty seconds, this brilliant, brilliant theme song introduces the premise of the series, the cast of the series. And wheels out each cast character individually, where they all come on stage, take a bow, hmm. and they do something idiosyncratic of their and you yep. know, to their character yep. that says something about their character, you know, including the dog Astro, mm -hmm. right? And and off we go. So you know, uh, with Vampirella six six six, it's like Vampirella, <laughs> you know, her lesbian friend Victory, <laughs> Benny the Witch, nice. Benny the Witch, you know, and you know, and and people are listening to this going, who's Benny the Witch and who's who's Victory? And I go, get six six six, and you find hmm. out, nice, because we are we are going back to literally, you know, uh, the first pages that uh, our team ever did. Um, and what happens is uh, uh, the currently shipping uh, miniseries, this miniseries that's wrapping up now, it's called Rage, mm -hmm. it's Vampirella Dracula Rage. And uh, Vampirella has had a baby and uh, 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 Dracula has this kind of uh, cult following. They're like vampire maga, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're really, really into Dracula. And, and so they stole Vampirella's baby 
thinking it would please Dracula somehow. Uh, but it really pissed off Vampirella. So hence rage. Hmm, sure. So she's pretty upset about it. And she's tracking down these people. And she's going to kill every last one of them. And that's kind of the premise with rage. So at the end of rage, something happens that I won't say because it'll spoil it. But something happens at the end of rage where we kind of wipe the slate clean. And the next thing you will see will be Vampirella 666. And she wakes up in her apartment and uh, and we're back to square one in terms of when our team, our creative vision first arrived on this book. Mm. And it's a great jumping on point for new readers because we get the Jetson song. We get to meet all these people for the first time. And, you know, they're having these discussions and, you know, and you can see, you know, blah, 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 who, who Benny is and who this is and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And who the mom and here's the cast of characters and here's how the premise works. Okay. Now, if you have been a Vampirella reader, if you already read those early issues, if you're familiar with the cast and, and with the premise of the book, then when you read 666, you will notice immediately that none of this makes any sense, that something <laughs> is really, really wrong and really funny at the same time. You know, so new readers, they won't get mm. the jokes. Readers who have been reading all along, they will find it hilarious because they'll be like, Wait a minute, what the hell happened? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, they will see the Easter eggs. They will get the gags. They will understand, you know, uh, 666 is really funny. You may not think so because you've never read Vampirella before. So you don't know these characters and you don't know how all of this is wrong. Hmm. And, 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 you know, and, and that, that's the premise of this new story arc that Vampirella's world has been turned upside down. She doesn't realize it's been turned up upside down. You know, but she slowly begins to realize it and, you know, her choice is, you know, now do I do something about it or not? Because for me to do something about it, so for me to fix this means that some of these people who are now running around in the strip, they're dead. They died years ago. They shouldn't be walking. They shouldn't be in 666. They shouldn't be up and running, you know? So, you know, her personal conflict builds over the course of the, of the arc of the story where, you know, she's the only one who can make things right. But the price of making things right is losing these precious things that she's finally gotten back that she had lost before, and and she she's she's managed to get back. So will she or won't she? As of as now, while we sit, I don't know the answer to that question. Hmm. We're still we're still writing. <laughs> we're still doing that. I'm sold, priest. I'm sold. Priest is selling it here. I, I, I guess now, I guess with that said, really quick, I don't mean to put you on the hot, right. hot seat. Uh, is it? Maybe safe to assume it's short box exclusive. Prepare. Maybe is it safe to assume that are you going to be down for the ride as, as you know to seven hundred? I mean, is that a safe assumption? I mean, how far out do you see your time with Vampirella? I mean, you know, like I said earlier, you're five years in. You know, like you're almost yeah. to the you know the, this major milestone for seven hundred and you know sixty years of publishing. I mean, uh, how, how are you feeling uh, future wise? Well, I, I'll put it to you this way: there's so much untapped ground with Vampirella, hmm. you know, like, like I've been talking about doing like a, a mini series called Vampirella of Draculon because, you know, we have Ergon and I have created our own vision of Draculon. That is just fantastic, you know, and I love visiting that place. And I would like to do some stories about her as, you know, like a teenager on, on, uh, on Draculon, you know, uh, and then we did like the, the year one thing we went, got to see her as a child where she's got, sneaking the cow on the subway and it's doing stuff like that hmm. she was just this kind of uh wild child uh who had escaped like uh, uh her mother was uh, a bad person so they came and locked her mom up you know and she narrowly escaped being killed you know so she was kind of uh you know living on her own at you know at age 12 or whatever it was you know so there's a lot of ground untapped ground hmm. there's hundreds of stories to be told I think I would stick around uh, as long as Dynamite wanted me to be there and as long as I was having fun, you know, uh, but uh, I deal in the reality of the publishing environment, hmm. which is uh, uh, very tight. People have very short attention spans. So we'll just have to kind of, you know, That's fair. take it, you know, take it, uh, you know, one year at a time That's and fair. see, uh, you know, see where the wind blows. So you're, you've mentioned Ergun 
a uh, few times now. Gunduz, yes. Yeah, Ergen Gunduz is the yes. artist you work with currently, yes? Yes, from one, Turkey. One, one of the artists you've worked with currently. Um, and he's hysterical. He doesn't speak a word of English. Okay. And yet he gets all my jokes. <laughs> this, he gets them all. This, he's just hilarious, yes. So this is this is what I was, you're getting there, right? So like, what is it like? What is your workflow like? You're working with this guy. You've been working with this guy. He doesn't understand English. He gets all your jokes. How is the dynamic when you're creating, right? You are, you are, you have kind of a, a brand a little bit, you know, like there, you, and talking with you right now, you're a bit of a firebrand and I love the it. Bad boy of comics uh, writing the bad girl of comics. Okay. Look, look, <laughs> right. here's the, here's the thing. Sorry, let me, here. let me, let me gloat on a little bit here. We, we, listeners, if you know, you're, you're watching, listening, uh, I had a chance to catch up with some of the stuff you're doing with Vampirella, and I will say this, and this is a this is praise as far as you're concerned. You have a very pulpy style hmm. that elevates the material to a different level, right? Like you were talking about how plot point A meets plot point B, and here's the simplicity that's woven through a lot of mainstream comics. And what you're doing with Vampirella, I found refreshing because it reminds me of all of the uh, pulps like The Shadow or Doc Savage, stuff sure. like that, where you didn't yeah. know what was really happening in the narrative till sometimes by the end of the book, and it was rewarding. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, I actually feel like I went on an adventure as opposed to being sold like, oh, you're going to go on an adventure, and you see everything coming a mile away. Like The stuff you've done with Vampirella is freaking fantastic. So I got to ask, you, you and Urkun working together, what does that look like? I mean, do you guys uh, do you use Google Translate? How does this work? Tell, fill me in. Okay, uh, I we have a translator. We have a gentleman uh, uh, named Ilki uh, I L K E Ilki. This is fast, fast. Uh, uh, and uh, I forgot his last name. I could find it, um, but uh, basically, uh, uh, my editor Matt and I uh, we communicate with Ergon through him, huh. so he does. He actually takes the script and he will do a translation of the script, uh, and then uh, he sends that on to Ergun. Um, really quick, really quick, you, uh, Priest, has yeah. Elki ever been like, "What the hell do you want me to translate again?" <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, no, no. He, he, he's he, he's a, uh, he's either American or he speaks English okay. very well. But he, he maybe really a comic nerd too. Um, but uh, Ergun has never once. I mean. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it gets to the point where, like, we were doing this this uh, art called Interstellar, and that was our first trip to, to Draculon. And I wanted uh, Lilith's mother has been kidnapped, and she's being imprisoned, and she's being held by the cops on on, on Draculon. And I wanted some unique place to to tie her up. I didn't want to just say, okay, it's another Star Wars dungeon. And so, and I, so I'm, I'm going, hmm, and, I'm, and I'm writing the script, and I go, and I go, hmm, okay, well, she's. Uh, Bound and gagged and hung upside down inside a gravat. Boom. You know? Now, what's a gravat? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what a gravat was. I just said it's some sort it of... sounded good, though. ...giant creature. Yeah, just it sounds gravat, good. Yeah. You know? So, you know, so uh, uh, it goes through uh, Ilky, and, 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 like, you know, a few weeks later, the pages come in, and my God... It's this enormous, funny-looking uh, uh, beast of sorts, you know, and and it would and you know, and he has the the thing has swallowed uh, Lilith whole, uh, and it's it's just perfect, you know. And then um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to have like a deranged Apollo astronaut, hmm. you know, a guy who's like you know you know the old so the old uh, side about uh, you know the, the 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 Japanese soldier who's still you know, on Okinawa somewhere and it, it doesn't realize the war has been over for you know, years, you know, so it's like, I wanted to have this deranged astronaut, you know, I wanted to have our version of the Joker, hmm. you know, this guy who was just out there and just out of his mind, you know, um, and, and I, I described this guy, you know, not really knowing what, 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 what he would come back with. And, uh, and he came back with Shane. Shane is our, 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 our crazy, astronaut guy and he's like he's still wearing the pressure suit you know and he's got like this 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 white coat that's over the pressure suit and a white coat is is, is clearly he's not hasn't washed it in like a hundred years and it's got blood stains all over it and he's got like a knife and he's you know that kind of thing and he's why so serious you know he's he's really that guy 
uh, Ergon gets it. He just gets it. You know, uh, I, I can't explain it any better than that. He just went, wow, I've never been disappointed with what he came back with. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, he, you know, uh, you know, Vampirella, age 12, sneaks a cow onto a subway. I had no idea what that was going to look like. <laughs> That's and so cool. Was, it's what? just that's year one. That's uh, yeah. Vampirella year one. And then there's this, 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 and then you know, so we have that comedic moment. And then later in the book, she's now fourteen, you know, uh, and uh, she's been hiding out from the cops. The cops have discovered her. They're coming to the house. They're getting ready to raid the house. She runs out of the house and she strips off her clothes, you know, and she's running across the the desert, um, and uh, she's desperate to get away from the cops. And this is. The first flight. This is the uh. first time sprouting her wings, because when she was young, the way I've written the the, the, the vampire characters, when they're young, their wings are too small to, to actually give them lift. Hmm. They're like chickens. Sure, they can flap around, but they can't go anywhere. You know, so this is like you know her first flight. You know, so it's this very serious. So we have the comedic moment with the cow at the beginning of the thing, and now we have this this build up, this drum roll, three pages of her escaping the police, and then she's running across the desert, and you know you see blood spurting out of her back, and now you see these these things coming out of her back, and it's really gross and blah blah blah, and then you turn the page, and she takes off into into the sky, and it's this incredible shot hmm. of this young you know nymphette you know taking flight for the first time. Albeit with really creepy looking giant bat wings. Sure. You know, but but this is where we where we were, where I went, this is a guy who totally gets me, who, you know, has never dropped the ball. And uh Vampirella six 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 is probably the best art job this guy's ever done. I mean, he's had a long time to do it because we started really early on this, and for once he wasn't rushing a <laughs> rushing a deadline, but the, the amazing things that he does with color and the amazing things that he does with perspective, you know, now it doesn't look, it does not look like Jose Gonzalez. It doesn't have that classic Warren, you know, uh, uh, you know, sketchbook look. Sure. Uh, it, it looks more like animation, like an adult swim, you know, cartoon, but it absolutely works and it's absolutely fabulous. And I couldn't be happier working with the guy. It's, it's a, you know, it, it's a terrific partnership. I'm glad we're still rolling, uh, and uh, uh, and I think six 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 is actually, a, you know, a prime example of this guy, you know, at reeling from, wow, this is funny to somebody getting their head blown, <laughs> blown <laughs> off, which is not really funny yeah. when it happens. You know, so you know, we, we are reeling from one moment to the other, and there's a lot of, you know, WTF, what's happening here, you know, uh, uh, which is kind of par for the course as the mystery starts to uh, unfold and you start to realize something is wrong hmm. and it takes you a, a few pages to realize something is wrong unless you are familiar with the cast and the characters and you've been reading the book you'll know from page one you go okay something's wrong here you know one thing i found interesting about the solicitation for 666 is that it looks like it's going to be oversized and they're including a um a kind of like a retro um issue or story, a Vampirella story that, that you wrote back in 1999 for Vampirella Monthly number 19. Uh, I believe Alan Davis, who's one of my favorite artists, uh, had illustrated that. Um, so I think that's kind of a cool juxtaposition that we're getting, you know, your story for this brand new art and uh, arc and Vampirella, you know, juxtaposed with like an older story. I, I guess when's the last time that you revisited that? And do you remember anything from that, you know, uh, six, I mean, it's only a six page story, but, and it's a wordless story at that. So, you know, you, you brought up Larry Helma a few times, so it got me thinking about the silent issue. But I guess do you have anything, any memories that come to mind working with Alan Davis on this particular Bamparella story? Uh, I, 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 I didn't really work with Alan Davis. I worked with uh, David Bogart, who's now like some high and mighty vice president at Marvel. Oh, wow. You know, hi, David. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, so I worked the story out with him. Uh, and I was blessed and lucky enough to get Alan Davis to do it. And, and I bumped into Alan Davis in, a, in, a, in an elevator uh, uh, just a few months ago, you know, and we're, we're chatting in the elevator, you know, and, and I go, well, oh, you know, and we're chatting about something else, about how slow the elevator was, you know, you know, and we're exiting the elevator and I go, well, hi, I'm, I'm Christopher Priest. And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm Alan Davis. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, you know, this is serendipitous. 
you know, and I think I, I think I started immediately begging him to do some more work with me. And he was like, eh, we don't like you. No, I, I, I don't really, I, I think, I think, I think, I think Alan might be semi-retired. No, I think, I think yeah. he's just not doing a whole lot okay. uh, uh, these days. It's ironic that they chose that story hmm. because we're just coming off of this, 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 this miniseries, the Rage miniseries, which is about Vampirella's stolen baby. And the Alan Davis story is about a stolen baby. Interesting. And and Vampirella trying to get the baby home while she's she herself has suffered some sort of uh uh, uh life threatening wound and they're out in the middle of nowhere and the only nourishment that Vampirella has is the baby in her arms. So she is constantly tempted to 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 drink the blood of the baby because that's the only way that she can survive. Mm. So she's fighting against her own nature for six pages, trying to get that baby home. So I thought it was kind of ironic that they would they would wow. they would uh, choose uh, that story because it, it 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 folds so well into the themes that we have been uh, uh, working with. I just got goosebumps and like a fool, I was about to ask, "Well, well did she do it? Did she do it? Did she do it? Did she do it? Don't leave me on the edge of my seat." <laughs> That's good. Well, now you'll have to get. No, I'm to see. Actually, six, 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 and six, six, seven are 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 uh, kind of extended books. Six, six, hmm. seven. We are reprinting uh, eight pages from our original run because we are introducing or reintroducing Smart. Uh, nice. a Smart. villain uh, from the from uh, our earlier run. And I said, well, instead of me trying to explain who this guy is, why don't we just? It's the same writer, the same artist. Let's just. Open the book with this guy's origin uh, story, with a prologue uh, uh, that that shows this guy's origin. So you're really getting your bang for your buck if you, uh, uh, you know, if you if you uh, uh, try us out with six six six, excuse me, and six six seven. So I gotta ask, do you have like song like a soundtrack in your head when you are writing a story? Are there certain songs that you have attached to different moods or characters? Um, that maybe influence the writing style or I don't know, musical cues. And can I piggyback off that question how and, dare you? and also ask you, are you familiar with how much your first solo album goes for on something like Discogs? <laughs> <laughs> the, the record uh, nerd in me has, has to know, but Cesar's question first. Uh, okay. So, uh, music, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever thought about it, about about uh, music when I'm writing. Yeah, um, stupid. <laughs> I, I tend to be influenced more by, like, uh, you know, news, current events, hmm. uh, whatever I was watching on TV, you know, uh, you know, just really well-written film or whatever. And I go, well, here's an interesting concept or here's an interesting idea, you know. Um, so how about directors and, then? Who, who do you like from as from a film perspective? Oh, oh. For crying out loud, uh, you know Martin Scorsese. Oh, there you and, go. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, see, hmm, Coppola. You know, uh, well, well, yeah, uh, Coppola on occasion. You know, you know, depends on what the what what the what the thing is. You know, but uh, 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 Christopher Nolan. Hmm. You know, uh, I was just watching Oppenheimer, and uh, I, I went to see it with a friend of mine. And uh, and I and I, I I told him I said look you know not many people I don't want to say regular people that sounds like such a snobby thing to say but not many people are really going to get Christopher Nolan's films you know like Tenet or uh, Interstellar you know even the Memento. first pass yeah you know I I myself need to watch something two or three times hmm. I know I will watch Oppenheimer I just watched it a second time here at home. I will watch it a couple more times to really get all of it because Christopher Nolan does kind of what I do where he does all this stuff out of sequence, you know, uh, and sometimes as in the case of Tenet, he's doing stuff backwards, you know, they'll, Oh yeah, we can really follow that. Thank you, buddy. You know? Um, uh, so, uh, but what he does is he actually asks for, if not demands audience participation. So I've been told by Marvel and DC that I make people work too hard. Hmm. To, to, you know, I'm making the reader, I'm requiring too much reader input. And, you know, what I'm inspired by is like guys like Frank Miller. Uh, and I knew Frank Miller when he was just, before he was Frank Miller. I, I know when he was, 
fight me or don't hurt me. <laughs> no. These are the stories. Yeah, he, All right, let's hear it. Yeah. When he was a skinny kid yeah. who was showing up at Marvel trying to get work, you know, and Denny O'Neill took him took him astray and, you know, took him under his wing and, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, Denny O'Neill was like my main, I think, influence. My mm. biggest influence, along with guys like David Michelinie, mm. Roger Stern, and of course Chris Claremont, uh, who I just adore. Uh, but but Denny was was just you know he's like a he was like a dad to me. You got any cool stories uh, about Denny? Probably half a dozen, but let me stick with this for a second. Okay, sure. So so you know when Frank started showing up, you know you know I, I kind of you know would see him in passing, and we, you know we kind of you know hello hello hello. <laughs> You know, um, and uh, once he started uh, not just drawing Daredevil, but writing Daredevil, uh, I became this huge Frank Miller fan. And I, you know, and even though I knew him, I still admired him, which is weird to admire somebody that you actually know, you know, but it's, but, you know, it's like, oh, oh wow. This, you know, and I would like, you know, I, and, and you know, half a million other people, you know, hopefully you too, you know, would get like, you know, Frank Miller Daredevil and we're reading it from cover to cover. And you know, and you get to page twenty or twenty two or whatever it was in those days, and you're pissed off that there isn't more. Hmm. And you see the letters page, no, no, it's the letters page. No, 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 wait, no, no. You know, and and, and, and you know, you get to the end of this thing, and, and and I would I would finish the comic and I would set it down and I would go, Oh crap. <laughs> you know, because it was just, you know, like 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 the like the kingpin like the kingpin's wife had gotten kidnapped by these people who live in the subway you know and kingpin is really stressing out and he's he's full of grief worrying about Vanessa you know and he's in his office and he's like brooding oh, I'm kingpin I'm brooding you know and then this wedding band comes is tossed in from off panel and bounces off of his desk and it's Vanessa's ring you know and immediately without even looking at he knows it's Daredevil all over there somewhere and, and, and without even looking at him, he goes, what do you want? And Daredevil basically, you know, lays out his terms. He wants Kingpin to release the mayor, his hold on the mayor or whatever, whatever the plot was. And, and, and see, guys, to me, the plot was actually incidental. You know, I was invested. You were invested. We were invested in the characters. characters. We were invested in these relationships and this unbelievable feud between this the, the, this this chubby bald headed guy that was kind of a joke in Spider Man, but but Frank made him into this compelling character, you know. And I said to myself, and I'm sure I said it out loud many times, I, I want to make readers feel that way when they get done with my story. Hmm. I want you to get to the last page of Superman Lost number nine, and I, I want to just blow your head off when you see that last page. Hmm. I want you to go. Holy crap! How is he going to get out of this one? You know, and 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 that's what I'm trying for. I don't always succeed. You know, uh, I may only succeed. I may only rarely succeed. But I am trying to earn your five bucks. Hmm. I'm trying like hell to make you feel like, okay, it was worth spending time in in this world with these characters. See kids, yeah, see that. kids. You guys, this is a man who's putting the work in, so that way you get your bang for your buck. All right. Since we're on the the topic of of Marvel. Uh, oh, I, I would be remiss if I if I didn't ask this, uh, and it's again a, just a little series for a quick minute. One of my favorite articles, comic book articles ever, is one that was written by uh, Abraham Reisman. Um, uh, big shout out to him. We had him on the show uh, another lifetime ago, but he wrote a really good editorial about you in 2018, around the same time the Black Panther movie was coming out. I believe it's called uh, Christopher Priest, the man that saved, the man that made Black Panther cool. And, oh, I remember that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Really, it's one of my favorite articles. I share it a lot. And in it, he, you know, he really shines a light on your career and the the things that, you know, you contributed to comics. One of those being breaking down the, the, the color line when it came to, uh, you know, being the first black full time full time black writer and editor at any of the big two. And and I was curious, you know, hearing you talk about, you know, I, I got to know him when he was, you know, Frank Miller when he started out, you know, I got Daniel O'Neill stories. I, I guess it, when you think back to that time, like, did you feel that that I, I I won't call it weight, but did you feel that that moment? Like, did you feel like, wow, I'm really doing something monumental that they'll talk about from years from now? You know, I'm opening doors for you know future <laughs> i know i know where this is going already or or did it just feel like just another day you know like i'm i'm here at marvel doing what i do oh my god i was you know 
I had I had no sense of me being the first hmm. anything. I was 17 years old. I was a kid, you know, and I was kind of an obnoxious kid, hmm. you know. And one day, Marie Severin, the uh, art director at yep. the time, Marie Severin uh, says, uh, "Jim, can you come into my office for a minute?" And I went, "Yeah, oh, sure." You know, and I figured she wants me to go get her sharpen her pencils or something. I don't know. You know, and I go in the office and she closes the door. And Marie Severin, who was like this sweet sort of motherly type, this gregarious, very funny, very warm woman, she turns into the mother from hell. And she goes, <laughs> okay, listen to me here, kid. Nobody wants you here. Okay. You know, hmm. and she just proceeds to like read me the riot act that I was being too familiar, too obnoxious, whatever the story was. Marvel was like this. It was exactly the way you thought it was in the in the bullpen bulletins. You know, you know the the atmosphere that Stanley created was like this almost circus like atmosphere. Okay, uh, and maybe I was taking it too far, and I was just being too prankster-ish, or I was too obnoxious. I don't know. I was I was something, but you know, Marie read me the riot act because uh, basically nobody wanted me here, and they were all going to ask Shooter to get rid of me. You know, so Marie actually saved me uh and, and and at the time you know you know you, nobody enjoys a good spanking you know uh but uh you know she calmed my happy ass down and uh uh and and that really that really saved me at, at marvel and, hmm. and 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 to a certain extent she became responsible uh uh you know for my career so you know at the time i was just like this guy this this kid getting coffee but you know, you have to understand that, you know, my first day at Marvel, this was 1978, my first day at Marvel, I am led into the bullpen, the Marvel bullpen, and they did have a big bullpen at the time, you know, and I go up to this kid, you know, and they introduced me to this other kid, and, and, and the kid goes, wow, I'm so glad to see you, and he reaches around his neck, and he takes off this, 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 this necklace, and he reaches over and puts it around, like, like a ceremonial, he puts it around my neck, and now I have this key hanging around my neck and it's the key to the Xerox machine. And he was like, he was so glad to see me because now he doesn't have to be bothered with the damn Xerox machine anymore, unclogging the Xerox machine. And that's how I met John Romita Jr. Hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, that's uh, funny. So, you know, Len Wein and uh, Dave Cockrum uh, shared an office in the back room. Oh, uh, wow. Marv Wolfman would come and go, you know, and like I said, I would do all the Xeroxing for, for him. Uh, uh, Al Milgram, Joe Duffy, they shared an office there. Uh, Carl Potts was next door to, uh, to, uh, Larry Hama, who I ended up uh, eventually working for. Eventually they hired Michael Golden. Michael Golden became our neighbor and we would go and have these really long lunches. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I learned visual storytelling from Stan Lee, from Stan sitting there with original Jack Kirby pencils in his hmm. hand or let me show you something, Jim, you know, and he's, and he's teaching me how to do sequential storytelling from pages from the master himself, original Jack Kirby art and, and Stan himself in his office teaching me this stuff. So it was just like, you know, you're surrounded by all of these, you know, so, so guys like Chris Claremont, he's like a new guy, you know, standing in the, you know, and I've certainly Frank Miller's a new guy. And then, and then one day there's this, 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 this homeless guy who wanders in off the street. <laughs> I don't know how he got in and he's wandering up and down the hall and I didn't say anything because it's not my place, you know, you know, but like, you know, so I, uh, I don't know what's going on here. So I come back the next day and the, the homeless guy is still there. He's still wandering up down the hall, you know, and at some point the guy, you know, comes by and he starts talking to Larry and, and, and Larry talks to him for a minute. Then he starts wandering down the hall again. And I see this guy just ambling up and down the hall, you know, so at some point I just went, I turned to Larry and I go, Larry, who's, who's that guy? And Larry goes, <laughs> you don't know who that is, <laughs> you know? And I went, no, and he goes, that's Denny O'Neill, <laughs> you, know, you know, and this guy was like my idol, you know, but, you know, and, you know he, he, he wasn't to say Denny was not a fashion horse is to be, you know, he was, <laughs> you know, at, at any rate, you know, I, I, I just, uh, yeah, you know, and, and it just over the course of time, to, long story short, uh, Jim Shooter kind of forced me onto hmm. Power Man and Iron Fist. Denny was not, not pleased about that. You know, but uh, as we started working together, I guess at some point he thought, well, maybe this kid actually does have some talent. Um, and uh, and then we just graduated from Power Man, Iron Fist to other things and eventually to DC yeah. and whatever. 
uh, and to the point where he, you know, he and Larry were really kind of like surrogate fathers mm. uh, to me. And, uh, you know, Marvel was my family. I hmm. grew up there that I literally, you know, grew up in that place. And I can't tell you how much love I had for that place and, uh, and for the people in it. Priest, okay, we can invite you back for a part two when we can talk Marvel. Obviously, All right, you don't have gosh. to twist my arm. No. Please, come <laughs> on, dude, please. But I, I want, and, and for real, I, I would love to have you come back just to talk, you know, those early uh, Marvel years. But hearing you talk about, you know, starting out, you said, I think, 79. And then, you know, trying to do the mental math in my head. It's almost like 50 years you've been in the game. And one thing I told was telling Cesar before we hit record I was like, man. Is that you wanted a leather jacket like you had <laughs> in that picture? Yes. <laughs> I we, still have that jacket. We all I still have that jacket. That's what it was. Everyone was hating on the jacket. So, well, I was telling Cesar that I'm like, man, you know, Priest is the walking embodiment. Now, now, Grant, I think some of our listeners would have to be familiar with, with your story, the ups and downs, the, the, the hiatuses. You've kind of alluded to, to some of those. But I was telling C, I was like, man, Christopher Priest is the walking embodiment of just when I thought I got out of the game, they keep pulling me right back in. Yeah. And and I'm curious to hear from you when you think back kind of holistically, you know, uh, through this crazy ride that has been your comic book profession. What's been, and maybe you can boil it down to one or two moments, but what's been the proudest moment for you? Like when at the end of the day, like what can you hang your hat on that you're like, you know what, no matter what, this meant the most to me. This, you know, this made it all worthwhile. Well, that's a tough one, but He's uh like, and why is it Vampirella six six six? Dying my PR, I got you. I, I I'm pretty sure that the first thing that's, that 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 springs to mind is is Superman Lost. Cool, wow. um, cool. That hmm. uh, I think that if I never wrote another comic book again, I would be satisfied with that being the last thing. Wow. I did. Not only for DC, but just did. Period. Hmm. I think if I got hit by a meteor, uh, I'm very proud of the work, um, and. Uh, I can't tell you what it means to me to uh, finally uh, not be thought of as a black writer. Wow. I am a writer who happens to be black, but, you know, I, I really uh, thought it unfair. And my exile was completely self-imposed. It wasn't like no, no one was offering me things. They would just only offer me black characters, you know, um, and I thought, you know, the fact that uh, we did this wonderful job, the whole team did this wonderful job, Carlo Pagulian and 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 everyone else on that book uh, with uh, with Superman. Uh, it's a it's a it's 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 just a moment where I feel like, okay, now I can exhale. Where like you know I, I'm back to being like competitive, hmm. accepted uh, as 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 uh, a creative talent in my own right. And not limited by the color of my skin. Wow! And and that was an important uh, uh, moment. I mean, uh, that was the first Superman series ever assigned to a black writer. Ever. Wow! History in the making. Wow! And just my being able to put this guy to the test. Yeah. You know, uh, have you seen my servant Job? Mm. You know, uh, consider him. You know, well, yeah. let me put this guy to the test, and, and you know, and put him through the ringer. And and I'll and I'll show you that the guy will crumble or whatever. So that's the devil making some bargain with God. Sure, sure, sure. You know, but uh, uh, you know, for me, it was just uh, uh, it's forty five years or almost forty six now uh, of being under the glass ceiling. And uh, in the early days at Marvel, I never felt or was even aware of a limitation because. I wrote Spider-Man, I wrote Thor, I wrote the Hulk. I, I, you know, they let me compete for jobs. Uh, Shooter let me be competitive on, on, on all levels for jobs. You know, I did Spider-Man versus Wolverine, you know, um, and then I did Black Panther and all of a sudden now I'm a black writer, mm. which, is, which is ironic because the Black Panther comic book was not actually about the Black Panther. It was a comic book about this guy named Everett Ross. Right, right. And his collision course with a cultural awakening, you know, so it was Everett Ross's observations of this, of this king of Wakanda, you know, that's what the story was about. 
it was about the white guy. It wasn't really about the Black Panther, right. you know, uh, right. but somehow I became typecast. Also, thank you um, for letting Mephisto give Everett Ross pants when he, <laughs> when he asked the for The devil's them. pants. Yes, yeah, he's just yes, like, exactly. oh, my God, does my soul belong to him now? Oh, no. Like, it's great. You know, so, you know, I have this, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a man of many hangups and, hmm. and uh my writing style is not necessarily, as we discussed earlier, uh, a good fit for the mainstream. So I am frequently overlooked or not invited to the party hmm. at Marvel and DC. Hmm. You know, uh, so uh, having the opportunity to do the Superman book, you know, uh, that 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 was a, a major uh, uh, thing for me. Um, it was it was. Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, it, it just—it was very hmm. special. It meant a lot to me, and uh, I, I'm ready for the media right now to just take me out. I'm, I'm, I'm good. good. Please, it, you brought up Black Panther, so I, I've got to ask because I'd be remiss because I know my dad is listening and waiting. I, he would actually prefer if we just talk Black Panther for two hours, but I'm, I'm just going to. We just did, dude. Well, you missed it. Oh, that's what happened. Yeah. You missed it, man. Damn pizza, man. <laughs> uh, anyway, what I wanted to know is what. Uh, let me take a step back. I guess what was going through your head knowing that one of the most anticipated, I, I'm saying this in hindsight, one of the most anticipated and then critically acclaimed MCU movies was based, was pulling so much from your iconic oh, story. Dude, yeah. And you know, and, and this, and, and that movie, Black Panther 1 came out February 2018. So not only is, you know, that article also written in 2018. So there's a lot of attention on, on your series. You know, it felt like, you know, your name was, was, was everywhere. And, and then, you know, also we're also talking about Van Barella. That's also the same year that, you know, Nick Barucci comes and gives you that opportunity. I guess what was your headspace in 2018 with this movie coming out and just your career, in, I guess, in total? Well, you know, I always feel like to, that today is the last day of my career. Or write again. I'll never hmm. another offer. You know, so uh, I usually hate everything I do. Uh, After I'm this show, it definitely will be <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, I'm definitely like a glass half empty yeah. kind of guy. You know, uh, so the Black Panther movie, I was really convinced that nobody would go to see it. Oh boy, so, were you, you wrong? Know, I, I was talking to the uh, the, uh, the executive producer Nate Moore, hmm. and uh, and I said, well, Nate, you know. Um, I'm just really concerned that people won't go see the movie because hmm. black superheroes have never been uh, very successful sales wise, you know, and Nate just kind of laughed and he's like, they'll come see it, you know, they'll, they'll come see it, you know, and I think with the black Panther movie, uh, Marvel discovered an audience they didn't know they had hmm. because you had like grandmas who came to that movie yep. you had, you know, Latino families and Latina families. And you had, you True know, story. That, 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 that came to see this movie uh, people who would never have any interest in coming to see a, a superhero movie came to see it became a cultural it, it almost became like this thing you had to do 100 you know particularly if you're black you have to go see this movie now it is required you you must <laughs> you must you know stop what you're doing and go see the black panther um and uh i was invited to do the premiere and uh along with uh Ta-Nehisi coates and don mcgregor and 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 you know uh you know, many other uh, creators uh, who would, because Black Panther has a lot of daddies. For sure. And uh, I can tell you it was a, a real emotional, almost verging on religious uh, experience for me. Wow. Uh, particularly that moment where you get the flyover, the first sighting of Wakanda. Oh, yeah. You see the huts and so forth. And, and, and Ryan Coogler had this wonderful music that's playing, you know, and then the, uh, you know, the, the, the veil lifts and you see this magnificent city. And my first thought was like, you know, that's what Atlanta should be. That's what, you know, parts of Chicago wow. should be. It should be, you know, hmm. we need to put the guns down and stop squabbling with each other and start working together, hmm. you know, and that's what, you know, what, what our society is capable of if we would just aspire to it and, and dedicate our ourselves and our children, you know, uh, to uh, to aspirational goals. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was a, a terrific experience. The only bummer about it was that at some point I, I, I left my seat to go to the, uh, men's room and Snoop Dogg hit on my date. Uh, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, 
Snoop Dogg. The real and then somebody killmonger. Realized, and then somebody realized Snoop Dogg was sitting back there huh. in the cheap seats with us. And they said, oh, no, come with me, Mr. Dog. And they, they moved him to. <laughs> Mr. Dog. Oh, wow. Yeah. They moved him to much better seats. And I was like, well, the comic book people are always like uh -uh. given. I, I, we're lucky to be invited at all. You know, <laughs> you know, but we're always like, you know, uh, like, like, you know, we were, we were at there. We were there for Endgame for the premiere for Endgame. And, you know, and, I, and I'm there with Mark Wade and with a bunch of other, you know, people and, and Reggie Hudlin and a bunch of people like that. And we're all like, you know, sitting way in the back. Damn. And I went, you know. These are the people that created these concepts, and there aren't many of us. It's not like we're going to take up that many seats, uh -huh. but shouldn't we have better seats than this? No respect, you know, man. Uh, it, it's, it's really kind of lopsided, and then we, we get these little honorariums, and don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for, you know, you know the, the few bucks that, that, that they, you know, that they you know, strip off for us or whatever, but it's really kind of insulting considering that, you know, they're getting all this... Uh, uh, all these ideas that, you know, they just have to go back through the bound volumes and read the stories and adapt them for the screen. Hmm. You know, you know, why not cut, you know, Steve Englehart a real check, you know, Preach. why not cut me a real check for Preach. Preach that, Preach it, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, black Panther made a billion and a half dollars. Where's my house. I should get a house out of that. <laughs> At least a house, you know, just, you know, Big house, not a mansion, not a not fifty cents house, but uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, a right? garden. I'm on a yeah. garden, you know. Yeah, Nickelback, Nickelback's yeah. house. I'm there with you. <laughs> Did you ever have an opportunity to meet or or interact with, with Ryan Coogler or even like the late great, you know, Chadwick Boseman? Yes, I, <laughs> I met them both. Come um, on. we we did. Uh, a behind the scenes piece. We did a round table discussion. It's available on the Black Panther Blu-ray and, oh, wow. uh, and the uh, the 4K uh, disc release. Uh, you go into the extras, there's a uh, round table discussion and there's uh, the producers and, 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 and Ryan, the director and so forth. And then there's me, uh, Don McGregor and Ta-Nehisi Coates. Wow. Uh, we got to, I got to hang out with uh, Robert Joe Cole, who was the co-writer with, and, and, uh, and with Ryan. Uh, and, and we were waiting a very long time for Tana Coates to get there because Tana Coates had fallen asleep in his hotel room. Oh and boy! <laughs> so we, we got you know the whole crew <laughs> and the lighting guys, the sound guys, and we're all on, and they're on the clock. We're not getting paid, but they're on the clock, and we're you know, yeah. we're just going, huh? <laughs> you know, and then finally he shows up. You know, so I I did get to spend some time with him, hmm. uh, and then uh, I was on set in Atlanta for. Uh, 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 Infinity War, hmm. uh, and there's a scene in Infinity War, I believe it's Infinity War, where they uh, the Avengers go to uh, Wakanda mm -hmm. and ask uh, uh, solicit the Black Panthers' help, and there's this walk and talk down a hill, and they get to the bottom of the hill, and you pan around, and there's the Winter Soldier. That that scene there, you know, if, uh, I, I'm standing just off screen, I'm I'm right there, hmm. <laughs> standing right there, you know, while they shoot that scene. It, it, let me tell you, fellas, if you're ever invited to a movie set, you know, like I was on the set with Scarlett Johansson and Mark Ruffalo, and they were doing a scene for uh, uh, for Infinity Wars. In the, the, they're in the uh, Quinjet, and they got this Quinjet, and they, they've got it on the soundstage, and it's this big friggin', you know, Quinjet, you know. Uh, and I will tell you, it's the most exciting 15 minutes of your life, followed by hours of boredom. <laughs> because they do that scene over hmm. and over and over and over and then they stop and they readjust the lights it takes them like an hour an hour wow. to readjust the lights and then they come back in and now they got the shot on scarlet and they do the scene over and over and hmm. over and then they adjust the lights again and then and now, they, now they're flipping it around for mark and, and over and over, and it's freezing. It's like, it's like a, a meat locker in there, and you can't leave. It's like a roach motel. You, you know, the security is so tight, you know, so you, you can only kind of come and go at certain intervals, or whatever. Hmm. And I'm going, ah, you know. So, you know, when I met when I met uh, uh, Mr. Bozeman, uh, that was that was actually on location during the walk and talk, doing that scene there, you know. And uh, they took a break because they, I, I don't know, they were doing whatever they were doing. They're always taking a break at these things. And and he was over by craft services, and I and I, I saw some guy with a headset, and I said, "Hey, could I go over and say hello to uh, to Mr. Bozeman?" 
And the guy with the headset, he looks over at, at, at Chadwick and he looks back at me. He goes, I don't see why not. He's standing right there. You know, and I was like, well, I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't want to get kicked off the set. You know, so, you know, I go creeping up, you know, to Chadwick and I'm like sneaking up on him like a cat burglar because I don't want to startle him. I don't know why I'm doing that, you know, but, it, you know, he's Chadwick Boseman and, I, and I'm not, you know what I mean? So I'm like, eh, I'm going to creep up on the guy. And he turns around, he's got like the sandwich, you know, whatever. And, and I said, uh, and my voice goes up two octaves. I don't know why. He just goes up to whack and all of a sudden, ah, I'm Jerry Seinfeld. And, 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 you know, and all of a sudden, I'm just like, oh, yeah, excuse me, Mr. Balls, but I don't mean to disturb you with that. You know, I, I just want to say hello. I'm, I'm Christopher Priest, you know, and I'm starting to explain who I am. And, you know, before I can do that, he just breaks out this broad grin and he lunges over and gives me this big bear hug because the guy's a comics fan. He knows who I am. Oh, and he cool. read all this stuff, you know. And he starts talking to me, but he's talking to me in this, and it, he's got this weird accent. And I'm going, what are you doing here? And I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? And, he, and he's talking to me, and we're like, okay, well, next time you're in L.A., I'll call Reggie, because Reggie Hudlin was directing him in Marshall, you know, uh, so I'll call Reggie, and we'll, we'll all hook up for lunch or something like that. It's like, oh, wow, a Hollywood lunch. I'll, I'll get the hookup, <laughs> you know, so we're making these plans, you know. But he's talking to me with this weird accent. And then it hits me. I go, oh, wait, wait, wait. He's still Shala. Huh. You know, because he doesn't want to get out of character because the dialogue, the dialect is difficult. You know, so once he's in, he's in and he won't break it, you know, for the in, in, until the shoot is over. But it, for a while, I was like, OK, what 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 is happening here? This is very hmm. strange. Uh, and uh, we got a picture together, which I can send to you at some point. And uh, that cool. was great. Um but tragically, he passed away before yeah. uh, uh, I made it out to, uh, to to L.A. And mm. uh, uh, but he was he could not have been more kind. He was very nice. Uh, I got to meet Ke uh, Kevin Feige. Uh, so uh, the word got upstairs to wherever Kevin was when I was on the set. This is when we were at the studio. And and Kevin comes down from the ivory tower or the, <laughs> the beanstalk, where, wherever he's got his <laughs> office, you know. Uh, and he comes down and he comes over. I heard you were here. I had to come over and introduce myself. And I was like, but, you know, it's it's just, like I said, it's this weird dichotomy because I feel like when I'm when I'm dealing sometimes with the companies, they're like, eh, old man, you know, uh, you know, but, but you know, I'm on the set and here's, you know, Anthony Russo and here's his brother. And they took the time, you know, to, to come over, introduce themselves and get the handshake and let's get a picture and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and it was it was really gratifying and really nice that a that they knew or cared who I was, mm. you know. Um, I uh, Mark Ruffalo brushed past me to get to craft services, so it was kind of like you know, <laughs> boom, like the Hulk just kind of. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I just got like brushed past by Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> that was very cool, you know. Uh, but yeah, it, it's 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 uh, it, it was wonderful to uh, to just interact with all that, and and yeah, it, it is kind of surreal to see characters that you created walking around breathing and there, and here wow. is, you know, that, uh, you know, Denny Guerra, you know, you know, you know, speaking these, this, this dialogue and, and becoming this character and, you know, uh, and these other characters that are, that are, that, that they have brought to life. And I'm just, uh, uh, I, I was really humbled by it. Wow. I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, if, if you'll send me that photo, I'd, I'd love to post it or, yeah. or work it into a, a reel or something. Um, <laughs> Priest, you have been extremely gracious with your time and, and your stories. And like I said, I feel like uh, there's a part two, maybe even a part three in this conversation somewhere. But I want to be respectful of your time and your evening. Sure. And I, I've only got one more que or question for you, but I, I do want to go ahead and remind everyone that's listening right now. Vampirella 666 will be out on Valentine's Day, the same day that this episode is available. It's a fresh jumping on point. And as you can tell, Mr. Priest is extremely passionate um, about buy it for your mom, buy it for your dad, <laughs> yeah. buy it as a gift for your loved one, your significant other. Nothing says Look, I love you like Vampirella six six six. Come on, everybody, get there, on board. There's enough covers that there's something for. There's little something for everybody. I mean, it's yes. it's great. It's great. But jokes aside, um, I I I always end uh, an interview with this question, and I think it's it's applicable here, and I'd love to get your perspective on what this. What is your credit card number? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so no, no, sorry, no, sorry. Different one, no, different interview. 
What's one piece of advice that you'd give to aspiring comic creators, and maybe specifically black and, and uh, people of color writers who want to be recognized purely for their talent without the necessity of, of hyphen? You know, you've mentioned that you're now at a career where you feel proud to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm not a black writer. I'm a writer. Like, what, what advice would you give to those aspiring creators uh, that want to be in that same position? And, and maybe it's something that you wish someone had told you when you first started out. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, I would probably encourage people to like work through the mail and not let people know what you look like, uh, <laughs> you know, which That's is, which is kind of sad, yeah. but that, that would be applicable to hmm. female, you know, writers, non-binary hmm. writers, LGBTQ writers, you know, is it just to take all the bullshit out of it hmm. by neutralizing, you know, all of that by just, you know. I mean, DC Fontana wrote as DC Fontana. To, That's right. For Fontana for uh, Star Trek, you know, for years, you know, because had she written as Dorothy, uh, she probably the, the 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 network or the studio probably would have found some reason not to hire her, right. which is ridiculous. Gosh, what a great you know? pull! <laughs> um, so nowadays, it, it, it it's less of well, we we discriminate against blacks, so we discriminate against you know these other different uh, you know people uh, of color yeah. demographics. Uh, but it's just, it's too easy to pigeonhole people and okay. So you're, 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 you're female. So we will offer you only female characters or whatever the story is. So, you know, that that's, you know, but, but by and large, when I run into people who go, you know, what advice do you have for me? I, you know, for, you know, I want to break into comics with what advice do you have for me? I, I, uh, universally say do something else. Um, and I mean that do something else. Being a writer is incredibly difficult. Uh, and comics is a very small industry. Uh, you know, uh, if you were a television writer, that's very difficult too. That may be even more difficult on some levels. Um, but, uh, it, it pays better. You only need to write like 10 or 20 stories, maybe tops a year to, you know, to make the rent, you know, uh, and the industry is just much, 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 much bigger. Um, but, uh, uh, comics, uh, uh, you, you, you have to be creative. You have to do so much output to make the same money that TV people make. And uh, you have to do two or three times the output easy. And then uh, there are there's, there are no days off and you can't plan, you know, uh, like I can plan, uh, you know, we're going to go see Oppenheimer on Thursday, you know, um, but I'm working on an issue of Vampirella. I've got an artist with nothing on his board. He needs that script. And I'm stuck. My brain will not cooperate, you know, and I'm pacing around like Denny used to pace up and down the hall when I call him the homeless guy. You know, he was right. That's how he wrote. He would pace up and down, you know, and and, and think, you know, so uh, it's lonely work. You you, you do it on your own. Uh, you're up all night. You're banging your head against the wall. You're praying for an idea. You're desperate for an idea because you have to get the work done by thus and such date or whatever the story is or the rent's going to be late or the car note's going to be late or whatever the story is. So it's tough on families. It's tough on relationships. Your significant other is going to be pissed because most civilians don't understand what a writer goes through in order to, you know, all you see is the person typing. Okay. Typing. That's the last part of the job. By the time I'm actually typing, I've already suffered, you know, 20, 30 hours, you know, with this, you know, uh, working out the story, working on the details and, the, and so forth. So typing, that that takes me two days. I can type a script. And I know exactly how long that's going to take. It's going to take me two days to type this script. But first, I have to think up the story. And God only knows when that's going to happen. Hmm. And nine out of ten times, my wife and I, we have planned to do thus and so. And we get up to that date and I go, I can't go because I've got to get the story done because the guy is waiting. You know, or if I do go, I'm not going to enjoy myself because while we're visiting her mother or whatever the story is, all I'm thinking about is like, my God, I've got to get the story done. Uh, and it's cost me a couple of marriages and it's cost most of my friends, you know, relationships. Uh, it's very tough. It's a very tough thing to do. Um, so just make sure that that's really what you want to do with your life because it's, it's, it's very hard. And then, uh, like I said, it's a small business and uh, it's hard to get in. It's hard to stay in. Um, not many people from my generation are still working. Hmm. I'm very blessed to still be working, to still be getting offered things uh, for whatever reason. And I certainly appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, uh, 
I don't encourage people to get into this line of work. It's 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 tough. It really is. Damn. He puts that, he puts reality check. check. See, there's see that's the thing though. All of that to say the hard work that goes into it, we as fans get to reap the benefit. So let me just say from both of us, thank you. And uh keep keep writing, man. Seriously. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll keep reading. <laughs> and thanks for the reality check, man. You got uh, the listeners thought we were going to end on some flowery, uh, uh, you know, uh, saccharin shit. Nah, reality check. But I I think to to echo Cesar's point, we are extremely appreciative that you yeah, know man. you are still out here doing the hard work and and putting out great content. I hope more I hope more opportunities like how you describe Superman happen for you, man. Yeah, that's that's a great feeling from what you're telling us. That's yeah. Pretty I could cool. definitely yeah. yeah. You it's inspiring it. me. It didn't even happen to me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, pretty yeah, cool. I just kind of, I, I just kind of felt like, well, uh, well, finally, we broke through that uh, yeah. that glass uh, that glass ceiling. I, I guess just you know? I guess just hearing you describe how difficult it is, and you know, like you wouldn't recommend it. I guess w- what keeps you going then? You know, like I, I get, I would imagine you've got <laughs> oh, what rent? You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, enough said. Keeps me going. That's enough said. That's, oh, that's let great. me think about that. Uh, well, you know, but I'm but but, but I mean, wealthy. to your to your own uh, to, to your own response, like there's other avenues that you could be writing. I guess why oh, sure. why comics? Why after oh, all I'm... the heartbreak and all through the years, what keeps you going with comics? Well, first of all, I'm already in this business, so hmm. that that you know, so and I'm lazy, and you know, and I'm like, okay, I'll do Banana Man, you know, <laughs> okay, fine, you know, uh, uh, so. <laughs> I yeah. I'm sort of have my toe in the, the movie business. I, you know, uh, you know, I have sort of an arrangement with 50 cents G unit to produce uh, zero. One of my original characters that I, a creator owned characters that I, that was published by DC in the nineties. Um, so uh, I am, you know, sort of in progress of, uh, you know, doing some, some okay. Hollywood stuff, but I, I was never really that interested in, you know, and being in Hollywood, you know, that way. Um, also, I think I want to just hesitate to clean something up here is I don't want to lend the impression when I say glass ceiling, whatever, that it's like, well, you know, uh, you know, we won't let black people, you know, write Superman or whatever the story is. Um, I've been in the business 45 years. I've never met a black writer who expressed any interest in writing Superman. Hmm. Uh, they might want to write a black Superman. They might want to write Icon and Rocket. They might something like that you know um but i personally have never talked to a black writer who had an interest in writing superman i wanted to write superman because i want you to read my superman and come away with it going what's the big deal it's superman you know and that's the point that i was trying to make Hmm. that i can write superman as credibly as the next mark wade or you know the you know the next you know, your favorite writer here. Right. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's the point I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, that I encourage the publishers and the editors to stop thinking about gender hmm. and, and race and things like that when they're, when they're considering, you know, these kind of slots. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the glass ceiling for me uh, really involves my approach to story. And as we talked about and just taking us all the way full circle to the beginning of our discussion, that uh, mainstream comics tend to be a bit more formulaic and I tend to like complexity and I tend to like to go places that no one's been before and poke around and explore, you know, and like have all this, like with the Justice League, I I, I wanted to identify all of these pressure points, all of these points of diversion between the characters and then apply pressure and see what happens, you know? So, I had them all turn on Batman because I personally am sick of Batman. Justice League. <laughs> so they all go to Superman. They go, you got to talk to this guy. Uh, we're, we're just sick of him. You got to talk <laughs> Superman. No, no, we, we, we've had it, you know, and it was just, you know, and it was so much fun to, to, to introduce that sense of realistic uh, conflict that exists within any group, whether it's a choir, a church choir or a police force or a street gang, you know, it's unrealistic to have these generic characters in these generic relationships and they always get along and they never fight. That's utter nonsense. You know, so in my Justice League run, which was not well received by by the higher ups at DC, most of whom are now gone, you know, thank God. But but they, they didn't like it, to, to, to put it lightly, hmm. they didn't like it. 
you know, um, but it, it was kind of a rapid departure for the character, uh, for those characters and for that, for that premise. So, you know, uh, so when I say glass ceiling, I'm like, you know, I'm a guy that, uh, I, I'm not really thought of, uh, for a lot of these assignments because they know, well, priest is probably going to take us someplace we don't want to go. And I think just me personally, as a reader, I'm tired of reading the same story over and over again. I want to go places we haven't been before. You know, I like the fact that, you know, Tom King can take a character like the human target and go, wow, <laughs> you know, you know, hmm. or here's Mr. Miracle, who we haven't thought of in, in decades, you know, and it's wow. Yep, you yeah. know, yep. uh, 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 this is what I'm talking about. You know, I, I want I want to evoke that reaction. I want to inspire that reaction. Hmm. Uh, and I think that, you know, Tom should be given carte blanche and given opportunity to, to, to not just resurrect characters that we have you know sidelined or not thought of in a long time not just plastic man but you know you know let's 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 put him on you know all the marquee characters and, and see what he comes up with because i think the guy's brilliant and, and he goes there hmm. and that's what i'm talking about i want to go there he wants to go there and i don't know that i don't think that's the safe way i don't think it's the safe path and i think publishers want to tread in as much safety as possible because the numbers are that bad and they don't want, they don't like risk. And I think Tom King represents a certain, his approach can occasionally represent a certain level of risk and priest may represent a certain level of risk. So it has nothing to do with priest being black, but priest being priest. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the glass ceiling that's, that uh, I'm knocking on. That's kind of what I was thinking when I, I was like, yeah, I, I feel like that's, that's more or less yeah, where you're going. Yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah. the idea that you have. Look, I've got. I want to take something that is safe, and maybe for the sake of shaking things up, or for drama, or even for artistic merit. Hey, just to play yeah. entertainment, let's go somewhere. Yeah, it doesn't have to be controversial. Just different, yeah. you know. And I think I think I speak on behalf of of me and C and and the short box listeners. Uh, Priest, we are down for the ride. So wherever yeah. you want to take us, I think I think we'll follow. Um, for sure. And I think it's a, a good place as any to, to, to wrap this up. Well, it's and to say, be continued at least. Yo, yeah, to be continued. Because I, I, I've got so many more questions about this, your first, about the music career, about uh, uh, Mar. I don't even think we touched on too much about your early uh, DC years or involvement with Milestone. I've got a lot of questions. So hopefully we can make a part two happen later this year. But um, I, I would like to go ahead and wrap this one up and, and give you one last opportunity. Do you have anything in closing that you want to say to the listeners? Uh, whether it be about Vampirella or just anything else you got going on, do you have any shameless plugs? This is the this is the time. Oh no, the the, tr the trouble with shameless plugs is that they're all things that I'm not allowed to talk about because the companies haven't announced them. I got a Marvel project oh. that will probably be announced at some point, you know, uh, uh, hopefully soon. Um, you know, I, I've got a, a book with humanoids that uh, hey, it's wow, just taking a while for it to be to be drawn. Okay, you know, yeah. Uh, and then there's a there's a complete series of a, a five issue series from uh, Heavy Metal that is written, drawn, come on, lettered, priest. colored. It's ready to go, and 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 they went bankrupt. They 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 they, <laughs> oh, they, 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 they ceased publishing. Yeah, that's right. So you know, we're waiting for them to uh, get their financing or. Or maybe we find a white knight who wants to go in and maybe Image will publish it or hmm. maybe maybe Nick Barucci will publish it. There we go. But it's, it's called, you know, uh, it, it's, it, wow, now I'm, now, I'm, now I'm having a senior moment. I'm forgetting the name of my own series. Uh, it's called Entropy. Uh, and uh, it's it's drawn by uh, this new kid, Montos, who's drawing uh, Green Lantern. Uh, and uh, forget me, the art is unbelievably, oh my gosh, this guy just went completely to town. It's just unbelievably gorgeous artwork. And it's just a labor of love. It was produced by Joe Illich. Uh, he was the editor uh, at, at the time at, at Heavy Metal. Huh. It's a gorgeous project that's just sitting there somewhere Damn. on a hard drive. You know, so yeah, we got that. We got the, the Humanoids book is called Babylon. That should be announced shortly. I can't tell you the name of the of the, of the Marvel book because then that's all people will want to talk about. Right. That, that's getting ready to happen. Hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and with DC, we are, we are, we are having discussions over a range of ideas about what, what to do next. Hell yeah. So there's, there's one thing that's kind of on it, on its feet. Uh, and it was interrupted. It was supposed to be part of the future state. Uh, and then they said, well, let's pull it out of future state and make it a graphic novel or a mini series. So we may be doing that or we may be doing something else. So there's a couple of possibilities. Oh. But at this point, until they announce it, I don't want to actually go. 
uh, we're doing that. Damn. So it sounds like we are. <laughs> it sounds like we are not getting another long hiatus of priest. Pretty. Look, it, uh, it sounds like pretty soon everyone's going to be able to do what you did earlier and chant. Priest, 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 priest. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, well, there's a bunch of stuff in the pipeline, and we'll just have to see what, yeah. what what drips out of it this year. So we'll have to see what happens. Well, we look forward to the George Absolutely. Costanza origin story uh, that you'll be writing. <laughs> I'd love to do uh, it. Called yes. Festivus for the Rest of Us. I'm excited. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. Priest, has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. You yeah. have a uh, wonderful evening, and like I said, uh, you are more than welcome back on the Shore Box. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man.